art students, speaking of cute, got together to build some happy little clouds and happy little trees. Yeah, it was sky blue shirts, big auburn wigs everywhere as they all dressed up to look like Bob Ross. Did you know that Bob Ross could film an entire season of his show, The Joy of Painting, in just two days? From brush strokes that turned mistakes into happy accidents and a voice that lulled insomniacs into soothing sleep, the artist was phenomenal. And yet, beyond the happy hippie persona on TV, Ross's life faced a tragedy that caused uproars in the hearts of his fans. Today we delve into the life story of Bob Ross, from his peaceful episodes to the battles he dealt with privately. Early Life To fully understand Ross's complex tragedies, it's crucial to explore aspects of his early life. Robert Norman Ross, or Bob Ross as he was famously known, was born on October 29, 1942 in Daytona Beach, Florida to parents Jack and Ollie Ross. His father Jack was a carpenter and his mother Ollie was a waitress. Bob grew up in Orlando, Florida in a humble home. As a young boy, Bob was known for caring for injured animals discriminating against none. From snakes and alligators to armadillos and squirrels, he cared for them all. His passion and care for animals were later aired in his television show, spread across several episodes. In ninth grade, Bob dropped out of high school, choosing instead to work with his father as a carpenter. However, Bob lost part of his left index finger in an accident involving a saw while working as a carpenter with his father. Fortunately, that would do nothing to affect his ability to paint or hold a palette later in the future. Military Career In 1961, a few months after he turned 18, Ross joined the U.S. Air Force where he served for 20 years. Ross was a tall man of 6 foot and 2 inches. Towering over most, however, what was an impressive height also turned out to be a problem for him. His outstanding height and flat feet meant that he could not train as a pilot or work on planes. He was relegated to a desk job where he would work as a medical records technician. When Ross reached the rank of Master Sergeant, he described himself as the guy who makes you scrub the latrine, the guy who makes you make your bed, the guy who screams at you for being late to work. Ross was so hard on the recruits that he earned the nickname Bust Em Up Bobby. However, although Ross was good at his job, he hated having to play the role of a disciplinarian and screaming at the recruits and his subordinates to the extent of being known specifically for that. The soft-spoken man with a gentle personality we all knew later was born out of his desire to distance himself from the man he was in the military, which prompted him to promise himself that he would be softer after leaving, a promise he stayed true to. Ross served as the first sergeant of the clinic at the Eielson Air Force Base in Alaska. His time in Alaska was where he first saw snow and mountains, and it was what brought about his interest in landscape paintings, as opposed to all other forms of painting. The landscape would be a recurring theme in his paintings later in the future. Would Ross's transition from a life in the army to a life as a painter be all that he had dreamed of, or will he come to regret his decision? First Steps as an Artist Bob Ross first took an interest in painting in the early 1960s when the United Service Organizations Club started a painting lesson while he was still stationed in Alaska. However, although he found painting interesting and continued to paint, it was not until 1975 that Bob Ross would finally have a deep passion for it. Ross's interest in painting deepened when he saw the show the Magic of Oil Painting in 1975, which was hosted by German painter William Alexander from 1975 to 1982. Ross had spent 17 years in the Army at the time. According to Ross in a later interview, it almost made me angry the first time I saw Alexander on TV, that he could do in a matter of minutes what took me days to do. At the time, it took Ross days to paint a picture because of the style of painting he'd learnt. However, he had just been introduced to what would make up the rest of his painting career. The wet-on-wet -wet technique was a painting style that involved applying oil paint on top of still wet paint instead of waiting for the paint to dry before layering it with another. This method meant that the idea could be quickly transferred onto the canvas to create the image, which was what made it a perfect art style for a television program. He painted constantly while he was still serving in the military, and usually sold his paintings, which were usually of the Alaskan landscape, 
to tourists. He soon began to make more money selling his paintings than he made in the military. He worked in taverns to supplement the money he made in the military, and it was there that painted, although his paintings were mostly on gold panning tins. It helped him learn how to paint quickly and also to brush up his skill with painting. Ross did not only sell paintings, but he also gave demonstrations, which added to the appeal of his art as people marveled at the sight of him painting and creating art right in front of them. In 1981, Ross would retire from the military after 20 years and would seek out Alexander, who he had religiously watched on TV up until that point. As a result of his deep interest in learning the art form, he became Alexander's best student, however, that didn't pay very well, and although he managed to arrange a few paid lessons as a painting instructor, it was barely enough to survive on. Ross's signature afro came in an attempt to save money on haircuts. He let his hair grow and instead got a perm. In later years, he made up his mind never to cut it off as it had become his signature look. Although he disliked the hairstyle and felt like he was stuck with it, he couldn't cut it off because it had become an integral part of his identity as a painter and man. Ross's hair and style projected a lovable hippie persona. Almost always dressed in denim shirts and jeans and with a calm speaking voice that bordered on intimacy and made the viewers feel like they were on a one-on-one -on -one painting session with him despite the large numbers he pulled in with his show every episode. Ross had a magnetic effect that endeared his fans to him with every episode they watched. The calm man with his soothing effect and his references to happy little trees and clouds. To some, watching him paint was more than just learning the art. It was also therapeutic. Ross later gained his traveling instructor certificate after he became one of Alexander's traveling instructors. Ross later adopted this method of painting. However, it wasn't as profitable as he'd hoped in the first years of his painting career. In 1983, however, Ross premiered on PBS with his show, The Joy of Painting, which aired for 11 years, three years more than his predecessor and much more successful. Personal Life Bob Ross's personal life was not rough, although it did not bear the same calmness and happy-go-lucky tone that his life in his show carried. Ross was married three times and had two children. He had his first child while he was still a teenager, although not much is known about that child. His second child, Robert Stephen Ross, otherwise known as Steve Ross, was from his relationship with his first wife, Vivian Ridge. The pair would divorce in 1977, allegedly as a result of Ross's infidelity. Ross married his second wife, Jane, shortly after the end of his first marriage. The two were happy together and would go on to be business partners until the time of her death in 1992. Unfortunately, their marriage was not blessed with any children. In 1995, Ross married his third wife, Linda Brown, two months before his death. There are speculations about the reasons for his marriage to her. Although he had become a public figure, Ross was secretive about his personal life, choosing to keep things private. Brush with the Kowalskis. Ross's first encounter with the Kowalskis happened when Annette Kowalski attended a painting class he held as a means to cope. At the time, she was desperately grieving the loss of her son and sought a means to escape her pain. Ross's class would turn out to be exactly what she needed as she was mesmerized by the way he painted. Annette was the wife of Walt Kowalski, a retired CIA agent who had a knack for business and the connections to be successful at it. Their brush with Ross led to the television show The Joy of Painting and the celebrity status Ross would later enjoy as a result of the TV show. In 1983, The Joy of Painting was created, and PBS stations across the country picked it up. It would air on PBS for 11 years, and in 1984, Bob Ross Inc. was launched by the Kowalskis and the Rosses. Bob and his wife Jane shared equal partnership with Annette and her husband Walt. They had managed to create the perfect avenue to spread the value of art around the world as the show managed to broadcast to 277 stations daily, reaching over 80 million people. This, however, did not sit well with his former mentor, William Alexander, who had taught him the wet-on-wet -wet technique which he now used on his show, putting Alexander out of business. For Alexander, Ross's action was a betrayal he had never expected. His student had not only stolen from him, 
but also showed to the whole world that he could do it better, an act that bothered the mentor. Although Alexander claims to have created the wet-on-wet -wet technique, the painting style has been in existence since Caravaggio, who was quite known for painting with oil colors. Alexander had failed to realize exactly what it was that drew people to Ross's show. It wasn't because of the painting style, although it helped that he could finish a painting in a half hour before the show ended. However, it was Bob's personality, his calm, sensual tone, and his ability to get even the restless minds to relax and follow along with his painting sessions. It did not matter if they were painting at home themselves or if they were simply watching as a means to idly pass the time. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for Alexander. His strong German accent, which interfered with his pronunciation of English words, did not elicit the same emotions that Ross was known for. Ross's joy of painting show did bring joy to those who watched him. He had created an atmosphere for people to simply be themselves as they learned painting with him as a friend. Bob Ross's painting style was very easily taught and would have been quite easy to copy by anyone truly interested in painting. However, what they couldn't copy was his personality and the true and honest passion his voice and actions portrayed. In an episode of his show, Ross painted only in gray tones after he was approached by a fan of his work who wished to paint but couldn't do so because he was colorblind and only saw in gray tones. His compassion for his fans drew even more viewers to his show and had people singing his praise, showing that he wasn't in it for the money, but he truly loved what he did. Ross utilized the half hour each episode aired to paint, making sure to carry his viewers along with the technique and sometimes even entertaining commentaries. Ross continued to find ways to make his show even more interesting for his viewers, including bringing in his pet squirrel, Peapod, on the show as a special guest. Audiences found this delightful, and Peapod would continue to make an appearance on the show. Surprisingly, in the 11 years that the show aired on PBS, although the show was top-rated and aired 403 episodes, Ross was never paid for any episode. They were all done for free. However, Ross made his money through other means. Their interest was in growing the show and receiving publicity for their company, BRI. The company marketed instructional books, videos, and art supplies using the Bob Ross name. He also offered painting workshops with teachers who had been trained in his method of wet-on-wet -wet painting. By 1991, their sacrifice had paid off. What was once a company built with an idea of what could be had turned into a $15 million per year enterprise. Unlike the Kowalskis, Ross did not care much for the money that was earned. Instead, he was more interested in creating a platform where people could learn art much like he had and have quality products while they learned the craft. The Kowalskis cared more about maximizing profits even if that included cutting corners. It is often said that money has a way of bringing out people's true personalities, and in the case of Ross and the Kowalskis, this would not be far from the truth. Unhappy Accidents As the years rolled by and the partners' relationships continued to grow, rumors would start to circulate about the dynamics of their relationship. It was rumored that Ross and Annette were involved in a secret affair, However, the Kowalski family denied it to be mere rumors. However, years later, Steve Ross, Ross's son, would bring it up once again, alluding to the fact that it was indeed true. Issues began to stem from what had been a peaceful relationship between the business partners when Ross's wife, Jane, passed away in 1992 from cancer. The business partners had agreed in a contract at the creation of the company that following the death of a partner, their portion of the shares would be divided equally between the three remaining business partners instead of passing on to their relationship partners. With the death of Ross's wife and the division of her shares among the others, Ross had become a minority vote in a company that profited off his public image and his name. In John D. Rockefeller's words, a friendship founded on business is better than a business founded on friendship. Jane's death was the catalyst that would prove these words to be true in Ross's life. The show must go on. In the 11 years that the show aired, 
Although Ross had some special guests, people and animals included, there was one who was more special than all the others, his son, Steve. Throughout the show, Ross continued to invite his son to the show to paint. He would sometimes sit and make small commentaries as Steve dazzled the audience with his painting, sometimes dropping small hints that showed his true intentions. Ross was preparing for his son to take over his place when it came time for him to retire from the show. However, although Steve was a good artist himself, evidenced in the paintings he created both on the show and outside of it, he did not care to follow in his father's footsteps and take after him. For Ross, his son was a terrific painter, and he knew he would be able to carry on with the show if needed. However, for Steve, it was not the same. The pressure of following in his father's footsteps would put a strain on their relationship. A fight broke out between the two and they didn't speak together for several years as a result. The two would, unfortunately, remain estranged for a long time and would only speak again after Ross was diagnosed with lymphoma just a few weeks after the death of his wife. In a later interview, Steve mentioned that he regretted his decision to not take over from where his father stopped. Although his illness had weakened his body and the diagnosis had weakened his spirit, Ross continued doing what he loved best, spreading joy one painting episode at a time. Ross continued making videos until he could no longer summon the strength it would take to get out of bed in the morning, let alone paint for 30 whole minutes. Despite the ticking time bomb inside of him, Ross managed to keep his diagnosis a secret from the entire crew that he worked with as he continued to spread joy and laughter with his jokes and stories while he painted. With his impending death hovering at the back of his mind, Ross delved deeper into his painting creating about three or four episodes a day. Not only did he wish to have more episodes out for his viewers after his death, but he also used it as a means to take his mind off his problem. Unfortunately for him, the people whom he had once called friends were no longer there for him. They cared more about what the disadvantage his death would put them at than the loss of a life. There would be no Bob Ross Inc. without the man whose identity created the brand. For them, it was all about finding a solution to their problem so they could continue to profit from the brand even after his inevitable death. As the end loomed nearer, the Kowalskis became desperate for the answer to their problem. The Kowalskis had turned into his greatest nightmare, and there was nothing he could do about it except for one. After 403 episodes equaling 13 shows, Ross ended the series with parting words no one could have known were messages signaling goodbye. The show began on January 11, 1983, and ended in 1994. One of Ross's goals was to host a TV show, and in 1995, as his life neared its end, he did just that, appearing in the show Elmer and Friends. Unfortunately, this would put an even greater strain on his already waning relationship with the Kowalskis. Now higher shareholders in the company, they believed they reserved control of the company and him since he was the face of the company. Ross had appeared on the show, wearing a wig to cover his already thinning hair. The Kowalskis believed that the audience would find out about his illness as a result, and it would only affect their business. Ross continued with the show, choosing to make the children happy and to fulfill his life's goal of hosting a TV show instead of appeasing the Kowalskis and their need for financial gain. The Kowalskis could tell that Ross's time was coming sooner than they hoped, and they would need to do something about it if they had any hope of enjoying the proceeds the company had begun to yield. While on his deathbed, Annette Kowalski visited the Ross family, although it was not a friendly one. Armed with a contract that meant Ross would have signed his name and the use of his likeness over to them, she approached Steve with claims of signing a contract that would help them create a memorial for Ross following his death. Steve, appalled by their sudden change of behavior towards his father since the news of his illness broke, refused to take the contract to his ailing father. Although Annette returned home with no signature on the contract, the Kowalski family had not given up their plans to own everything that concerned the artist. With each passing day when he did not sign, they grew even more agitated, 
Ross's life meant nothing to them past getting a single signature on a piece of paper. For them, his legacy and likeness were more important than the man himself. The Kowalskis constantly bothered the Ross household with calls, caring nothing for the dying man who had taken to bed for his last days of peace before he left the world. Steve recalled in an interview that his peaceful father lost his peace with every phone call. He would often hear him shouting in his room, yelling, You're not getting my name. I'm not giving you my name. Although Ross tried to hold on to what he cherished, keeping away the Kowalskis for as long as he could, he could never have expected what would happen following his death. Life After Ross On July 4, 1995, Bob Ross died due to complications from lymphoma at the age of 52. Ross's death had not come much as a surprise to him. For most of his adult life, he had given in to the addiction to nicotine and was a cigarette smoker. He had battled several health complications throughout his life and had expected that he would die young. He was buried at the Woodlawn Memorial Park in Gotha, Florida. Much like every area of his personal life, Ross had kept his diagnosis a secret from the public, with only close family and friends knowing about his death. The general public would not know of his death either until much later, after he had been buried. Even in death, the Kowalskis cared more about what the knowledge of his death would do to their business than about the fact that they had lost someone who once saw them as friends, even if he had been nothing more to them than a business opportunity. With the information of his death kept secret, only about 40 people showed up to his funeral. The Kowalskis had not been present. With Ross now out of the way under the terms of their agreement, the Kowalskis had full ownership of Bob Ross, Inc. Although the Kowalskis had gotten what they wanted, it was not enough. With Ross's death, it was only a matter of time before the general public found out about it, thus losing the advantage they had. Annette and Walt wanted more than just the company, as there was no way to keep it going now that the man whose face the company was built upon was gone. Nothing else would work if they couldn't lay their hands on the right to his name and likeness. The Kowalski's interest laid in using Ross's name for merchandising, which they couldn't do until they owned the rights to his name. They decided to try the aggressive route. Although Ross had not balked under the weight of their pressure and signed over the rights to his estate before his death, they were now going to get it using the legal way. Ross had written the Kowalskis out of his will and testament, leaving his estate and the rights to his name and likeness to his son, Steve and his half-brother Jimmy Cox. However, although that should have been enough to protect them from the Kowalskis and their scheming, they were about to be faced with more than they could have ever bargained for. The Kowalskis countered his will, claiming ownership of everything that Ross had owned during his time working under Bob Ross, Inc. The Kowalskis had done their research and were in it for all or nothing. In an interview he had, Steve recalls a phone call he received from Annette two days after the death of his father, where she told him he could never create a business regarding painting with the Bob Ross name, however. He was free to do anything else as long as it was not related to painting. At the end of his life, Ross had done all in his power to make sure that the Kowalskis never ended up with his intellectual properties, including his name and likeness, certain to address these issues in his will. He went as far as marrying his third wife, the nurse he had met while he was in the hospital, however, that would do nothing to prevent what was to come. The Kowalskis sued for Ross's estate, suing both his third wife and half-brother. They wanted everything that he had worked on and worked with. From the paintings he had made, to the paintbrushes that swiped across the canvases to create the artwork. The Kowalskis were on a suing spree. Not only did they sue the Ross family, but they also sued WIPB-TV, the PBS station that had been home to The Joy of Painting Show and a PBS children's TV show for a half million dollars. The children's show had been the same one that Bob did towards the end of his life in 1995. Ross had appeared in a green screen since he'd grown too weak to travel at the time, however, that would do nothing to stop the Kowalskis. By the time they were done, they owned almost everything that concerned Ross. Would this be the end for the Ross family? Or would they find a way to fight back and get back all that they lost? Bob's Legacy With the loss of his father and everything that concerned him, Steve was frustrated. The Kowalskis and their desire to sue anyone who stood in their way had instilled fear in him. Following the advice of his lawyer, 
Steve decided to sue them before they could find something else to take from him. He conducted his research to find anything that would prove that he had ownership over his father's name, and he did indeed find it. His father had made preparations for that so that, however, Steve was about to have a rude awakening. Jimmy Cox, who had been made guardian because Steve hadn't been old enough, had signed some papers to make the lawsuit they were faced with go away. Unfortunately, that meant he had signed over all rights to Bob Ross, Inc. They had taken everything, including the tape recordings of conversations between Ross and the Kowalskis. Unfortunately, Steve lost his lawsuit against Bob Ross, Inc. in June 2019. Achievements By the end of his life, Ross had painted approximately 30,000 paintings, and although many other artists have done notable works that deserve accolades, despite his unusually high number of original paintings, Ross's paintings are rarely ever found in the art market, usually snagged before news of their availability hits the market. Because of Ross's desire to keep his work from being turned into a means of financial gain, his paintings have never been sold in major auction houses. Bob Ross, Inc. continues to own the rights to many of the paintings he created while the show The Joy of Painting aired. His first painting, A Walk in the Woods, was originally sold for about $100 by a station volunteer who bought it and hung it on his wall for 39 years. However, now it's been appraised and stamped with an asking price of $9.85 million, one of the few paintings he created that are not owned by the Bob Ross, Inc. Although Bob Ross was a very famous artist, his art style has been described as a cross between fine art and entertainment memorabilia by an art appraisal service. His work, which bears a sharp contrast to other traditional artists, is most commonly sought after by fans of the show instead of wealthy collectors who prefer more seasonal pieces created by other artists. The only paintings owned by Bob Ross that continue to be in possession of collectors are those which were sold during the show and the ones he painted before the show that Bob Ross, Inc. have no claims to. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this one.